Hello, everybody. Welcome to the December 2021 Carnegie Lecture here at the History Center of San Luis Obispo County. My name is Thomas Kessler. I'm the Executive Director, uh, and I am very excited to have a wonderful audience of Dana family members uh, joining us in person, as well as um, a wonderful audience joining us online. Um, I want to remind folks that um, this is recording. You, if you miss anything, you will be able to um, catch this. The recording will be posted next week on the History Center's website. I also want to encourage everybody to make use of the chat box. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the lecture. And so if a question pops in your mind, don't risk forgetting about it. Go ahead and put it in um, the chat box. And yeah, I am really excited to introduce our speaker this evening, Joe Dana. Dana. Um, he's the great, great grandson of California pioneer Captain William Goodwin Dana. Uh, Joe wrote a biography of Captain Dana that expanded on a thesis Joe authored at UC Berkeley. He is here with some reflections on the life of Captain Dana, and he currently resides in Orchid and works as a district administrator with the Orchid Union School District. So without any further ado, please welcome our speaker. All right, Thomas, thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. Well, um, this is gonna be a first for me. I've never done a presentation that is both in person with a great audience and then also on Zoom. So. This is going to be um, really cool, actually. I want to thank everybody who is watching on Zoom. And I am going to just uh, work from some slides that I have prepared. So let me um, put those up. OK, so um, let, me, let me just start out by saying that I am so happy to be here at the History Center of San Luis Obispo County. And I thank John Ashbaugh and Thomas Kessler for inviting me. Um, what this presentation is going to be is some reflections on the life of my great-great-grandfather, Captain William Goodwin Dana. I'm gonna tell you about him, but it's not just gonna be about that. It's also gonna be about my own personal journey of connecting with Captain Dana I'm going to talk a little bit about his legacy and how we're preserving it many, many years after his life. And then finally, I will share what I feel are, are some thoughts are, are about the meaning of his life for all of us. And so um, I'm just glad to have you all aboard um, and we're going to proceed. Okay, so um, here's the outline of our presentation. Uh, like I said, I'm gonna talk about how I got to know uh, my great-great-grandfather, talk about his interesting historic life, talk about his legacy and how we're preserving it, and then talk about the meaning of it all. And so let me start with the story of how I got to know this awesome guy. When I attended college, I went away to the University of California at Berkeley. I was a history major. And I I'll, I'll admit it, I was a history geek. I love to research things and learn about things. Um, and one weekend, I had some time on a Saturday, on a Saturday morning. And I ventured over to a library at Berkeley called the Bancroft Library. It's a special collections library and it focuses on um, especially the West. And they have many uh, period uh, documents and literature. It's, it's really quite a place. So anyway, I went to the Bancroft and I thought, you know, I'm just gonna look up my own name. Let's look up Dana. 
Now, I'm going, this is a long time ago. Back, this is the age of card catalogs, okay? <laughs> so this is the mid 80s, a long time ago. And I went into the card catalogs at the Bancroft and I saw, yeah, there is material about Captain William Goodwin Dana. And so, and, and in fact, not just any old material, some of his letters. And so I filled out a request to see them and I figured that they would maybe give me a book or let me see a copy of them or whatever. And what, I actu what they actually brought out were the letters, the letters, the actual letters that Captain Dana had written. Now they were protected obviously, but here I am holding in my own hands a folder with letters written by Captain Dana. This is my great, great grandfather. It, it, it was quite a revelation. And as I looked at them, I saw even more about him. He wasn't any old guy. He was, these weren't just shopping lists or, or business uh, ledgers or whatever. These are letters with feelings and great writing. This guy was articulate. And let me read to you. This is part of a letter he wrote in 1828 to a friend of his named John Rogers Cooper. Now, listen to this writing here, okay? It's really in interesting. Quote, I have had damned bad luck as regards my debts and expect to lose at least $2,000 in San Diego alone. I have been able to meet all my debts as they come in and hope I shall still be able to, but I will see the whole of the coast of California damned before I trust them again as I have done. If you wish to make a man your enemy in this country, do him a favor by lending him a couple of hundred dollars. This is just one sample of Captain Dana's writing. This guy's entertaining, he's witty. He, um, is a, he expresses emotion and sharp opinion. And he's, it's, it's just so fun to get into his letters. And so I ended up, like I said, I'm a history geek, I'll admit it, doing more and more research into this guy. In fact, my parents, one weekend they were up in Berkeley. My dad is here, by the way. David Dana. And I brought them into the Bancroft Library to show them these letters. They loved it. But anyway, I did more research and I started what I, what I would call a treasure hunt in the libraries of UC Berkeley. And again, this is the mid eighties. We're working with print. We're not working with electronic anything. It's all print. So there are millions and millions of, of things up there. So I, that there were materials about Captain Dana all over the place on that campus. And then a few other places as well that I researched. So I did that. And then I decided to do a thesis required for my graduation on Captain Dana. And I called it, and this is a quote of his, quote, settling the damned, settling in the damned country, unquote, the life of California pioneer William Goodwin Dana. So I did a thesis. And I, I put that floppy disk on there because that's what it was on. <laughs> We're talking a long time ago, one of those really big floppy disks. And I ended up with some treasure because later in 2006, 2007 or so, um, the South County Historical Society and Arroyo Grande said, we heard about your thesis, Joe. We would like you to expand it into a book. And so I said, okay, that sounds good. So I took time and put a lot of time into writing more and researching more. And I ended up with this book, which this time um, I titled, quote, to discourage me is no easy matter, unquote. 
the life of California pioneer William Goodwin Dana. And I thought that quote was important because I think that quote really embodies his life. And I'm gonna get into his life in a little bit. Um, but anyway, so we had this book. And since then, I have given many, many presentations on Captain Dana all around uh, this area. Um, I've given them to groups like this, people who are interested in history. I've given them to community organizations that are, that are looking to know more. I've given them at the Dana Adobe, the captain's home. And maybe the most important of all, I've given them to third, fourth, and fifth graders because they need to know about all this. Um, and the picture I put there of me smiling with that woman next to me, that was one of the most unique presentations I did. That was in a winery. And I did half the presentation with wine glass in hand. I kind of liked that. So let's now get into this guy's amazing life. Captain William Goodwin Dana was truly an amazing person. He is worth, he is worth studying. He is worth knowing about. This guy is incredible in my, in my view. So let's start out and talk about the start of his life. It wasn't easy, folks. He was born on May 5th, 1797 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. His parents, you can see pictures of Elizabeth and William uh, Dana, by the way. Dana, not Dana, Dana. And I'll talk about Dana later. But anyway, this poor guy, when he was two years old, his dad passed away. His mother remarried. When William was four, his stepdad passed away. When he was nine, his mom passed away. So he's an orphan by age nine. What, I can't even imagine that kind of a start to a life. Um, and he bounced around with various relatives, spent some time in Connecticut. Um, a fellow family member, Ramon Dana, has done some research, which I'll, which I'll talk about later, and has found that little William spent time in Connecticut um, but ended up with, the, with his uncle, William Heath Davis, uh, brother of his mother. And William Heath Davis, you may have heard of him. He was a sea trader who spent time going from Boston around the Horn into the Pacific and basically hauling things from here to there. Back in those days, they didn't have trucks and Federal Express and Amazon Prime. They had to rely on ships and sea traders to haul a lot of big things around. And so William was around that. And that led to him having a life at sea. And so Dana took his first trip uh, to the Pacific when he was 18. He ended up taking numerous trips, um, some with William Heath Davis, some, some with others. Um, he um, went all over the place. He went to China, India, the Philippines, Alaska, Peru, California, all over. What a life. And ended up having his own brig called the Waverly, uh, owned and captained that. And he set up while he was around. And, and this, is, this guy was a man of action. I, I, I just admire a man who can be captaining a brig but meanwhile, he also sets up a store. He's making money doing that. Sets up a store in Honolulu. And so he uh, and his store in, in, in Hawaii um, kind of led to a life in Honolulu, um, which and we have uh, contemporary diaries of contemporaries that show that Dana was involved in giving parties, numerous dinners, luau's, Dana even owned a billiard room, which is great. And we probably have some relatives over in Hawaii too. Mm -hmm. So he had quite a life there. 
was very involved in the sandalwood trade um, from Hawaii to Asia. But then that trade kind of business declined. And so he decided to look for opportunities elsewhere. And that is what motivated him to come to California. And so um, Dana, in 1827, establishes permanent residence here in California. Now think about that. He, so he starts as this, he starts, think about his, the, the worlds he's been in. He starts in like the epitome of Yankee America, Boston, okay? Then he goes into the Pacific, spends time in Hawaii, which, which is its own country at that time, um, or its own, its own, you know, a very unique place. Asia, he's going all over the place. Now he goes to California, which is part of Mexico. And so he, think about all the languages he's, he's exposed to. Think about what he needs to do to become part of California, which is to become a citizen of Mexico, to become baptized in the Catholic church and to learn Spanish. And so his name goes from being William Goodwin Dana of Cambridge of Boston to Guillermo Dana, Don Guillermo Dana of California. And that, that's what leads to what we say now is Dana. And you can see a signature right there, Guillermo Dana. Now, he ends up in Santa Barbara. Why not? Santa Barbara is a pretty awesome place, isn't it? Um, he lives there for 10 years, 1827 to 1837. He has a store there. He's a businessman. He gets people to go out and hunt otter for him. Uh, he's very much a, kind of a, a, a merchant kind of a merchant who, who, who's who got lots of things working for him entrepreneurially. Um, he serves as captain of the port. He serves as alcalde of Santa Barbara, which is kind of a combination mayor judge position. He also got to know um, the guy in the picture at the bottom there, Carlos Antonio Carrillo, uh, who is maybe the most prominent figure in, in Santa Barbara. Uh, and is the person for whom Carrillo Street is named. And what was really important about that is Dana got to meet Carlos's daughter, Maria Josefa Carrillo. And they became, uh, they ultimately became a uh, man and wife, uh, husband and wife. And uh, it did take a, uh, it did take some time for them to get married because in order to get married, Dana had to secure permission uh, from the Mexican government in California for this to happen. And he, uh, and he got frustrated because it took a long time. It was a, it was a five month delay. And one of his letters, he writes about it. Uh, he says, quote, if she had shown the least disposition to retract, I should have been off long ago, but I'm now determined to carry it through thick and thin. He was there, he was staying with Maria, they were, he was going to make this happen. And the numbers you see at the bottom um, have some significance. When they were married, Maria was 16, Dana was 31. Now, when I share this with kids these days, I'll, I'll mention this and kids are like, oh my gosh, what is going on? I don't like this, you know, it, it, but this was pretty common back in those days because women wanted to marry men of means and men who could provide. And uh, so that was a common kind of age span. And then the other numbers, 21 and 13 had significance too. They ended up having 21 children. Maria had no twins, that's 21 pregnancies. <laughs> Sadly, only 13 of them lived past infancy. And many of us are Dana relatives here. We can talk later about which child we're descended from. My branch is, is the, the 19th child, David Amos Dana. And we'll talk about him a little later, but I, I'm from that 19th, 
branch. We're, we're, we're the best looking. No, but anyway, we're, we're going to go on. So let's talk about Napomo. So back in those days, California was this huge um, place, enormous place with maybe, how many people were living here at the time? 150, 200,000 maybe? So the Mexican government made land grants available to those who wished to seek them, men of course. Um, and so Dana wanted to get some land. He ended up with Rancho Napomo, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but Napomo was his third choice. His first choice was Ojai. He wanted to be there. He was denied. The, gover the governor said no to that one. His second choice was the Corral de la Piedra Rancho, which is located just south of San Luis Obispo Airport. If you take Price Canyon Road, you'll see a Corral de la Piedra road going out there. That's where his land grant would have been if he'd, if he'd received that. But, but the governor said no to that one too. So then Dana submitted a diseño, a design, a, a request for land in Napomo. And he was granted that request. So it was given to him April 6, 1837. It was, the, the, think about how big this area was. It went from the Santa Maria River in the south to the Los Barros Creek in the north, from the dunes on the west to well east of the Timatate Ridge in the east. 10 leagues of land. Now this grant was surveyed later at around 38,000 acres, but George Dana, one of my relatives, he and I have sat down and looked at this and our better belief is that we're talking more about 50 or 60,000 acres. Enormous. All of that was Dana Rancho property. So let's talk a little bit about the house, Casa de Dana. Um, the adobe that we all had the chance to visit and see um, was designed by um, the captain and built uh, mainly by Chumash workers. It began, the adobe didn't start the way it looks in this picture. It started with one story, more of a rectangular structure, and then wings were built onto it and a second story built on uh, until it had, it ultimately had 14 rooms. Um, and people have written about it saying that there was a New England influence in the Adobe's architecture and that they had this hallway, this hallway that comes in from the door with rooms coming out from there. So, um, it's, it's a fascinating place to visit, and we're going to talk about the adobe and its restoration in a little bit. So what did Captain Dana and his family do on their ranch? This guy was an entrepreneur, a businessman all the way. They had cattle happening. They took full advantage of all aspects of cattle. So obviously hide and tallow were part of that. Sheep. Uh, soap. Um, he did a trading out of Cave Landing, which is basically the area near Pirate's Cove, just south of Avila, or maybe southeast of Avila Beach. Um, and uh, he, he also benefited greatly in that at gold, during the gold rush toward the end of Dana's life, cattle were worth the price went way, way up, and he was able to uh, sell cattle for amazing prices per head. Turmoil in California. This is about the, the mid-1840s when California was a place where America started getting interested in it. 
And so America is like, hey, we better, let's, let's check out California. There's a lot here for us. And so the United States sent out some military expeditions through California. Um, one by one, one commanded by John Fremont, who we have heard of. Uh, that was in 1846 and 1847. Um, Fremont, by the way, stayed at the Dana Adobe in Napomo, he and his men. Uh, another expeditionary uh, group was the Stevenson Regiment, Jonathan Stevenson's regiment. His picture's on the, the bottom there. And again, they stayed um, at the Adobe at, in Napomo. Um, Dana didn't immediately side with the United States. He just kind of wanted everybody to get along and wanted peace. What was happening at the time is California was factionalized. There were factions within Mexican California. Then there were people from the United States. And there was lots of, of drama and turmoil and, and factionalism. Um, and, uh, but he ultimately did side with the United States. And in 1847, he allowed his home to be the meeting place of the first postal service in California. Um, the Adobe was where folks met between San Francisco and Los Angeles. Now, as we all know, through the Mexican War, the United States took over California. And so Dana goes from being in his life, he starts out as an American, he ends up out in the Pacific, he ends up, well, he, then he goes to California and is a Mexican citizen. At the end of his life, he's an American again, an American once more. And he became fully involved in all aspects of American rule um, and politics, everything involved you know, in association with California being part of the United States. His future son-in-law, Henry Teft, was a delegate to the California Constitutional Con Convention in 1849. You can see Teft's picture there. He is the one for whom Teft Street in Napomo is named. His Teft's wife, um, or, or betrothed at the time, was Maria Josefa Dana, one of uh, Captain and Mrs. Dana's daughters. Uh, California was admitted to the Union in September 1850. Um, Dana was involved in politics. He ran for state Senate. Uh, when he ran for state Senate, he got all the votes. It's very, you know, the, the, the district was San Luis Obispo County and Santa Barbara County. He got all the votes in San Luis Obispo County, but not too many in Santa Barbara County. It's kind of the same way now. But anyway, he served as county treasurer. He served as superintendent of county schools. He built one of San Luis Obispo County's first frame building, something called Casa Grande, a huge edifice built for $50,000, which was a lot of money back then. But Dana's journey came to an end, ultimately. Um, he, he died in February of 1858 um, of rheumatism. He um, really was not able to get around. He was pretty much paralyzed at the end of his life, um, was not able to, to get around anywhere. Um, and um, he's buried in the old mission cemetery just down on, on Higuera Street. And in fact, I, I certainly recommend that you go by there and visit that cemetery sometime. It's very interesting because he and, and Maria, by the way, Maria lived until September 1883. She lived for another 29 years after his death. Um, their graves are kind of in the middle of Old, of old Mission Cemetery. And, and, and there's lots of other Danas right around them. In fact, um, my dad um, lost one of his um, sisters, Luisita, and she's buried right near the captain. There's, there's several, many, many Danas there. Um, but anyway, I, I recommend dropping by there, checking it out, because it's really interesting to look at, look at the people buried there and their civil war 
um, the soldiers buried there. It's just very interesting. But anyway, Dana's life uh, ended in 1858. And, and I think when we look back at this man, he made an impact. He made an impact. And I think this quote I really like, um, the United States, while it was kind of checking out California, sent a consul, uh, Thomas Larkin, to Monterey. And Larkin's job was to get to know a lot of prominent Californians and then to write Secretary of State James Buchanan a profile of each one. And it's very interesting to read, by the way. And so here's what, here's what he had for William Goodwin Dana. Quote, a man of some wealth, of much respectability of character, of good and honest intentions, well-versed in the general information of the day, much looked up to by the poorer people and of some influence with them, never connected with the political characters of the day. It's a pretty good tribute, isn't it? And it just kind of resonates with me because I think it kind of shows this, this was a respected, consequential man. And he, um, he mattered in California history. And um, I think his life is worth, is worth study. In fact, I, I kind of think, I kind of think that Captain Dana's life ought to be one of these Netflix or live, live streaming series, you know, kind of like Yellowstone. Uh, maybe it could be called Vaquero Stone or, or Napomo or something, you know, but, but I, I think in the right hands, his life would be very riveting for people to follow. Okay, so now, I've told you about Captain Dana. Now, I wanna to go to the next part of our presentation and I wanna tell you about how we're working to preserve his legacy. And I think this is important. Um, so I think really an important part of preserving Captain Dana's legacy is restoring his home. And uh, many of us, I, many of us in this room have been involved with the Dana Adobe Napomo Amigos, um, now called the Dana Cultural Center. Um, they, we've been involved with them in helping restore the Adobe. Um, the Amigos were formed in 1999 um, by um, a woman named Lisa Vanderstad, who some of you may have may remember and have known. And Lisa um, just had this burning desire to get this place restored. She she just intuited that the Adobe was a special place, and uh, it it has involved many many people over the years. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I'm, I've been on the, um, uh, involved, uh, I've, you know, my dad has been involved. A number of us have, and it's been so worthwhile to see what's happened out there. So let me, let me be a little more specific. This is how the Adobe looked in the 1950s. Check that out. Look at how in disrepair it was left. It just, it, it, it was just kind of sitting there and rotting away. I don't know how else to say it. It was so sad. And the San Luis Obispo uh, Historical Society took, took possession and did some things to, to try to put it in a little better shape. Um, and it ended up, ended up kind of looking in the, in the 80s and 90s um, it kind of looked like what you see, a little bit like what you see in this picture. Um, let me go back to this one. Looked a little bit like what you see in this picture, okay? Where you see the, the Adobe and all the rest. Anyway, well, what happened is the Adobe Amigos were able to secure some grants from the state, some corporate donations and private donations that all led toward making the Adobe look better. And look at it now. Isn't this amazing? It's now as beautiful a building as there is on the Central Coast, in my opinion. 
It's a beauty now. It, it, it's majestic. It's, it's wonderful. And it's the product of hard work by so, so many people. And it's just every, every time I go there, I just feel, I feel a connection. And the property also has been beautified. This is a, a wonderful picture I found on the uh, Dana Adobe website, I think um, from a drone. But look at, look at how beautiful the property is. Um, it, it's, it's been well, well cared for and it's, it's a beauty. And, and um, when you go there, the nice thing about it is the view shed for the most part has been preserved so that if you go to the veranda, which is what, you, what we're looking at right now, the, we're, we're, we're looking from the east toward the adobe. If you go to the veranda, you can look out at the Tenetate Ridge and you can imagine yourself in the 1840s. It's special. There's not many places like that in America where things are the way they used to be. So anyway, we have that the inside of the adobe. Um, most all of you, I'm sure, have been there, but I, I'll, I'll just state that the inside is, is, has been so well kept. Um, everybody at the adobe has, has done so many great things. And what I, what I love about the adobe is every time I go and visit, it's better. It just gets better. They, 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 they do something to make it better every single day. And hats off to all the volunteers who do that. The picture bottom left there is the view from the adobe, which I think is really neat. That's, that's that, the, the, the Tamatate Ridge. So this makes possible, for purposes of this presentation, I'm just gonna call them Captain Dana day trips because in this age of, of COVID, it's kind of nice to be able to get outside and, and, uh, and kind of do different things. And, um, uh, you know, the Adobe is a wonderful place where you can just hike around. Um, the picture you see on the left, those are my kids um, at, at the Adobe after we'd had a good rain. It was just beautiful, really greened up out there. Um, on the right top, is uh, go to the Adobe itself, visit the Adobe and, and check out the inside. Um, but anyway, you, may, maybe if you're lucky, the cupola will be open and you can go and hike or, or climb up into that tower. And from that tower, you can see all, all around, you can see into Teff Street, that area, and all the way down into Santa Maria. It's really cool. And then I already mentioned the old Mission Cemetery, I think is a great day trip or, 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 or a brief, a brief visit because you can get, you know, learn about history through that. I want to put in a plug for something that this center has been working on. And that is a self guided walking tour for the Dana Adobe. And it's a um, 12 page um, handout. And I know John Ashbaugh has been working on this. It's really wonderful. And I, I love the map. Uh, there are detailed descriptions of aspects of the adobe and the grounds. And it's a great accompaniment if you are gonna take one of those Captain Dana day trips to the adobe. Then, how else are we Oh, I'm sorry, here's the, here's the, the map from, from that handout. Um, all right, how else are we telling Captain Dana's story? Well, the, the Dana Adobe Cultural Center has a um, museum uh, component to their um, building, their, their cultural center building. So go there and check that out. They rotate exhibits and are, are always um, putting up fresh, um, exhibits and artifacts that help us learn about Captain Dana and his family and, and the Rancho Ranchero period. Uh, field trips for students are fantastic out there. These are some kids making adobe bricks. Uh, I've been involved in a lot, uh, in, in a lot of field trips for kids um, through my, because I'm an educator. We've had kids at Vaquero stations. We've had kids taking tours through the, through the home and learning about the lives of the family. I mean, it's just, 
the, the field trips are, are great experiences for kids. And the Dana family is keeping the story alive too. And so there are three books I wanna mention all written by Dana family members that I think are worth, um, if you don't have them, you might wanna consider getting them. The first is The Blonde Ranchero. This is written by one of the captain's sons, Juan Francisco Dana. It's a entertaining, fun, witty, great account of Juan Francisco's life growing up in, in, in Casa de Donna and just growing up in, in life on the Central Coast. It's a great book. It, if you wanna go back into that period, I think Juan Ranchero is indispensable. My book, um, which I, I've already mentioned, I think my book gives a nice um, recap of the captain's life. And have, we have lots of art, lots of photos in the book. And I think it's a nice, um, good overview of the captain's life and, and some good references. Ramon, Ramon Dana, uh, a few years ago came out with a book called William Goodwin Dana, Pioneer Californian, A New World, A New Life. And you can get this online. online. And he, where, where he, he did a lot more, he was able to do a lot more research into the captain's life in the East and also the captain's life in Hawaii and came up with, with some new um, sourcing and, and new information, very, very helpful. And he, he put it all into the book. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, worth, it's worth having, but I will say that we're still waiting for David McCullough or Doris Kearns Goodwin or someone like that to turn their attention to William Goodwin Dana. We're still waiting for that one popular historical author to do that. And I think, I think his would be worthy of, um, would be worthy of a book by someone like that. So what does this all mean? And this is the final part of my presentation. And what, what, what is, what does what I'm sharing mean for, for us? And what does it mean for everybody on the Zoom? Um, so here, here's what I think it means. I've just told you about my great, great grandfather. And I've just told you about my family. But my family story isn't better than anybody else's. Everybody's family has a story that's compelling and interesting. And so I just want to end by just with the call to action. I want to encourage everybody here, everybody on the Zoom to, to preserve your own family legacy. And so there are some points I, I want to make. First, celebrate family. Have family get-togethers and family reunions. This, the picture you see here, is the last time we did a Dana family reunion. This is in front of the Adobe. Um, we had hundreds of people there. And uh, some of the people here in this picture are here tonight actually uh, in person. But anyway, um, I, I just encourage everybody to celebrate family. I think family is just, it's the core of life. Um, not just family reunions, but family branch reunions are fun. This is a branch reunion of the David Amos Dana branch. And this is my great grandfather, my dad's grandfather. Good looking guy, right? Um, but anyway, this is a, 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 a branch. Uh, these are folks who, are, who, who descend from David, David Amos Dana. Explore your own roots. I, I think it's really important for folks to get to know their own family and to, 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 to learn about their own grandparents, their own great grandparents and, and what their stories are. Because like I said, I think every family has a story just as compelling as what I've shared. And tell your family's story. Um, if you're older, Write, your, write, write down what you have, do some videos, um, record it, film it. If you're younger, 
listen, listen to people who can share about your, about your family. Um, this was kind of cool. One of my cousins shared this photo. This is my grandfather. This is Amos Benjamin Dana in World War I. And um, she put it on Facebook and just kind of just put it on there. And I thought it was wonderful because those of us who are in that family, we can kind of look at it and say, hey, there's Grandpa Dana. You know, that's really cool. And so after all, what's, a, what's more important than family? And I just think it all comes down to family. And uh, I wanna thank you all for having me today. Um, if anybody ever wants to talk more about Captain Dana or our family, my contact information is right on there. Um, uh, at joseph.l.dana um, at gmail.com. And my phone number is right on there. Give me a call sometime if you ever want to talk. Anytime, I'm, I'm open to do that. And this is my family, by the way. Now, I've got a couple of bonus slides. Are you guys interested in some bonus sure. information? Okay, here we go. So a couple of bonus things I'm going to end with. And these are these didn't really fit in the presentation, but I, I figured, you know, I'm going to put them on at the end as bonus and talk about them. The first one is, there is a Dana buried in the mission just down the street from where we are tonight. If you enter Mission San Luis Obispo and look to the left, you're going to see the grave that is here. It's Adeline Eliza Dana. And uh, basically what happened there is Adeline, uh, this, the, there have been some other people who've done additional research on this. So I, I'm not gonna be the expert on this, but I will say that the general story is Adeline was this adorable little girl who died sadly at age five. Everybody loved her. And as a special honor for her and for the family, the priest at the mission agreed to have her buried in the wall of the mission. And so you go to the mission, you see this, and there's this poem on the grave, which is charming. This lovely bud, so young and fair, called hence by early doom, just came to show how sweet a flower in paradise would bloom. Pretty interesting, isn't it? So anyway, that's my son with, with the, the, at that grave. That's, he's, he's in that picture. Now, the other thing I wanna talk about, the question, I'll just tell a story. I used to work in Los Alamos. One night it was about 8 p.m. and I was on one, Highway 135 and I was literally the only person on the road and I wanted to get home. I was going fast. I'm not gonna say how fast, but I was going fast. <laughs> And sure enough, highway patrol guy is hiding behind a bush. He pulls out, pulls me over. And I'm like, oh my gosh. He says, okay, pull out your driver's license. I pull out the driver's license. It was like the guy just lightened up. Are you related to Richard Henry Dana? <laughs> and so we got to talking and Fortunately, I got off the ticket. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, um, I get asked that question all the time, all the time. You know, are you related to two years before the mast and Richard Henry Dana? Well, here's, I, I actually devoted an appendix of my book to this. And I called it the oft asked question. And basically, um, it relates to this. In the book, Two Years Before the Mast, which I'm sure a number of you have read, Richard Henry describes a wedding that he attended in Santa Barbara, right? 1836. Um, it, it was the wedding of Alfred Robinson of Boston and Anita de la Guerra de, de Noriega y Carrillo uh, of Santa Barbara. Now, the, Richard Henry's account does not mention William Dana. You would think it would because William Dana almost certainly would have been a been present at this wedding, almost certainly. But Richard Henry doesn't mention him. 
And you'd think he would because they have the same last name. You'd think that people would connect them. Well, people have speculated on why Captain Dana was not mentioned. Some people say, oh, Richard Henry just forgot about him. You know, he, he had a lot going on, might have forgot about him in the notes. Other people say that, the, uh, that Richard Henry may have been embarrassed that he had a relative who, God forbid, became a citizen of Mexico and spoke Spanish and assimilated into the culture and all that, um, and was a Catholic. I mean, so there has been speculation, um, and I, I wrote about that in the appendix. We don't know, but it sure is interesting to think about whether they actually met, and if they did, why Richard Henry didn't mention Captain Dan. So anyway, those are my bonuses, uh, my bonus slides. I just want to thank you all so much for being here to listen. And I want to thank everybody on Zoom. We have, for the record, we have 51 people on Zoom. So most people are on Zoom right now, which is really cool. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for taking time on a Friday, Friday evening to hear about um, Captain Dana and to um, you know, to be together. So I appreciate that. So I'm I'm willing to take some questions if people have any questions. Yes, sir. I've got one, Joe. Um, you know, I, I was thinking, having read you know two years before the mass, and and then uh, your you know, your speculations and uh, you know what people thought about why he hadn't met his cousin Richard Henry Dana, or had, it was not mentioned anyway. You know, I was also thinking though about this point. That Richard Henry Dana made a big point about being a Boston Brahmin who leaves Harvard and he and he goes as a common sailor before the mass. And it was a literary thing. You know, I can almost imagine him thinking, taking notes and planning this thing the whole three, two years that he was sailing before the mass and the time he spent in California. And then I start to think, and I also think of the hospitality and uh, of William Goodwin Dan and his and his generosity. And it makes me think that and his open-mindedness after he's been exposed to so many cultures, it makes me think that that what Richard Henry Dan was doing, and I, I think he met, I think he met William Goodwin Dan in the Santa Barbara. And I think he was welcome. So this is my speculation. But I think it was because he had to maintain that literary pose. As a you know, I, went, I went to see it as a common sailor, and if he had, if he revealed that he had you know a, a, a cousin of means in California, it would have given it would have undercut what he was trying to do with two years before the mass. I think it was a literary pose. That's my speculation. You know. Yes. I to ask you to repeat the questions because our, yes. our, our Zoom audience has trouble here. I want to um, just recap what. Um, this gentleman said he 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 basically was offering his own speculation on Richard Henry uh, and Captain Dana, and he believes they did meet, and uh, believes that maybe Richard Henry um, omitted mentioned just because it might have countered some of the some of his own narrative about California and and all of that. Is that a fair statement? Yes, he had to maintain that literary pose. You know, yeah. that, that, he, that, that was two years before the mass. I think when he left Boston, he had ideas of writing about this, literary ambition. I mean, and so when he got to the West Coast, and he got to Santa Barbara, and he met a cousin, of, of, of influential cousin. I think they, they met, and I think they would have been welcome to each other. But I, but I think he had to maintain that literary when he wrote the book, he had to keep posing as the common sailor for the two men. Yeah. Yeah. They had given up privilege in order to go as a common sailor for the man. To, to expand on what he said, he felt Richard Henry just needed to have that literary pose of being a common sailor. <clears throat> Any questions on Zoom? Maybe we can see if... Um, I, have a, I have some. 
Okay. We have I, did, I didn't hear you mention if Richard Henry Dana and um, your great great grandfather, right? Um, <laughs> were related. Do you have a relationship to the Dana? Family? Oh, great question. Okay, so this gentleman is asking whether Captain Dana and Richard Henry were in fact related. The answer is yes. Okay. Not directly. That they, they were. Um, they're both from Massachusetts and both, both from Massachusetts. Mm, I think I might have it in my book in terms of the exact relation. Um, but they they were not like first cousins. It, it, oh, yeah. it would have been a little bit more of a, a distant connection. Fourth cousins. Fourth cousins. Fourth cousins. Okay. And I, I'm a newcomer to the area and you mentioned Something that sounded to me like Santafe Ridge. Could you give me the? The Timitate Ridge. T-E-M-E-T-A-T-E -E -E is the name of the ridge of foothills just east of Napomo. Okay. Well, I sure appreciate everybody being on Zoom. I'm looking, I'm kind of looking, looking through the list right here. I see Gina Bernero on there. Gina is one of the greats from the Dana Adobe Napomo Amigos. Made such a difference over there. I see some relatives on there. My Aunt Frances. Matt, Matthew Dan is on there. That is awesome. Friend of mine, Jennifer Kanarowski. I love this. Um, Stacy Avalar, someone I know. Dan Krieger, one of the great historians of the Central Coast. This is fantastic. I just love seeing you all on the Zoom, folks. Effie McDermott done great work um, as a historian of the Five Cities area and all of that. Oh, no, this is wonderful. I love seeing you guys on. I'm sure there's even, I, I, I'm, I'm, I know there's more who I know. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Uh, can you hear me OK, everyone? Yeah. Hold on, Rich, Richard, you're going to be next. We have one in person. Okay. Yes. So great question. So is the question is, is the Adobe a wedding venue now to um, support the organization? And the answer is yes. In fact, it's a wonderful wedding venue. Um, uh, and the Adobe, um, I, I, I become a member of the Dan and Adobe, you'll be, you'll receive emails with lots of events that happen there. And in fact, they're doing a gala fundraiser tomorrow night. And it's just a great place. And it, you also, this is kind of cool. My daughter is a high school senior. We wanted to have the Adobe be the backdrop for her senior pictures. And for just a small fee, we went in there and supported the Adobe and got some awesome pictures. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh. So, so this gentleman just said that his great grandfather's brother ended up having the Corral de la Piedra ranch just south of the San Luis Obispo Airport. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. I think there was another. There's a Richard Everett on the Zoom. One day. How do you do? Um, yeah, Richard Everett. I, I was just. Uh, in the uh, Carnegie Library the other day with my wife, who's from San Luis Obispo. I'm in San Francisco, and I'm a retired curator of maritime history. Um, and I'm also the author of the uh, entry for Richard Henry Dana in the Oxford Dictionary of American Literature. And wow. uh, I was very, uh, you know, always been fascinated with the um, uh, William Goodwin Dana story. I mean, here's this same name. I agree with the fellow. I thought it was a third cousin, but fourth, uh, I thought it was a little closer than that. Um, and I can add a few anecdotes. One is um, that uh, John Everett, who was my three times great uncle, was on the, sh on the pilgrim with Richard Henry Dana and never mentioned, just like William, Richard Henry Dana never mentions his cousin, visiting his cousin there. And um, I think it's, uh, a done a lot of research in a, but mostly a lot of thought that the reason for that is they were both classmates at Harvard and to admit that your classmate was with you on the ship and was behind the mast with the officers with the good food 
and, and making a wage and all, it'd be pretty embarrassing to say that you're almost the equivalent of your roommate is in the, in the back with the captain while you're up front two years before the mast in the forecastle with the, uh, the ball weevils and the bad crackers. And all. So um, also, but the similarity of that why he would never mention his cousin in California, it would totally destroy his narrative, which as we all know is an amazing book. And one thing very few people realize is that takes notes for this almost a, a year long voyage, he takes notes daily, keeps a diary of all of this in order to write this book at some point, perhaps, or maybe he didn't know it then, but when he gets back to Boston, he leaves the trunk on the dock and it, or he, and goes into a bar and it comes out, it's, it's gone. He loses his entire diary of every single day. Oh my God. Imagine that. And yet, some, I mean, one of the miracles of the world, the seven wonders of the world is that he was able to reconstruct it in such detail. Um, I find that amazing. But uh, to the gentleman who brought up why he never mentioned his cousin, I, I, I think that was you, Tom, I don't know. Uh, I'd agree. I mean, there's a, those two omissions um, are, are glaring and yet have a pretty good explanation. And Richard, where were you when I was writing my appendix about this? <laughs> where, where, where were you, Richard? <laughs> I, I was <laughs> learning how to be retired up here. Yeah. Let me make sure that our crowd heard. Did you all hear what he said? Yes. That was very interesting. That was yes. also, also been to the, the Dana Adobe there out of my self-interest in the story. And it is beautiful. And, uh, and John Everett, who was on the boat, he comes back later in life, as does Richard Henry Dana. They both come back as older men, California, as we know. And um, uh, he has a good friend in Los Angeles, Abel Stearns, who's a big merchant. He travels at a, uh, the Mission Trail there at least 10 times over 10 years, up and down before the Dana uh, uh, voyage, and then uh, after. And so he, when I stood on that veranda and looked out at that ridge, I thought, my God, this is my three times great uncle, stopped here many times, no doubt met Dana and probably traded dirt on Richard Henry while he was there, <laughs> anyway. We'll take uh, maybe one more question. It's been about an hour and I want to respect everyone's time. So it, do we have one in person or any, do we have another question on Zoom? I have a question. Sure. I'm, I'm Consuelo Macedo. Can you hear me? Yes, I sure, I sure can. Okay, I'm the vice president of the Cambria Historical Society mm. and I just really love your presentation. Just fantastic, oh. you're to be commended. Consuelo, and, uh, <laughs> thank you. you. You made my night, Consuelo. And if you ever would like for me to come up to Cambria and present, you just give I, me a call. I took a screenshot of your information. You're top of the list. Okay. <laughs> and one, of, one of the things that I do with our docents and our board members is arrange uh, field trips for us to go. And we're definitely going to go to the Dana. Uh, on a, and I'll check you know, dates and times for availability. I'm looking forward to doing that. And again, you're welcome to come anytime to us at the Cambria Historical Museum. We are open on just Saturdays and Sundays from one to four as we're phasing into, you know, full time that we, um, we're we trying to get back to what we used to do, just like everybody else. Very good. I, I will say uh, there is somebody on the Zoom who would be a great docent to take your group around. Her name is Gina Bernero. Ask for Gina. her because Gina, Gina. Okay. Yeah, Gina. Ask for Gina. She does a wonderful job. Oh, she I appreciate does. that. Thank you so much. She she gave she gave um, my work, the or I worked for the Orchid School District. We did our management retreat at the Adobe um, in August and we had um, we actually took tours of the Adobe and Gina was one of the docents and just could not have done a better job. Oh, great. Looking forward to that. Okay. We'll, well, let me, uh, go ahead, John. Mind, Come on in. Let's give him a hand or a round of applause here. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> good work. I, uh, I, I do know that Joe is uh, readily available, very cooperative. This has been the best uh, working relationship we've had with getting help from 
from a Carnegie lecturer, as we say, we do these every three months, but uh, Joe, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll send him on the road now <laughs> throughout the county, as far as Cambria or anywhere else. Uh, his book is, is for sale here. Uh, for any of you who may not have it yet, we'd be happy to, to uh, take your uh, cash check or, or a credit card. Uh, we also happen to have the Richard Henry Gaynor book too, two years before the mass. Uh, which, uh, and, and we also have a book, by the way, also by Kathy Cairns that is fairly new about uh, environmental pioneer women of the uh, 20th century. And uh, one of whom was a South County pioneer in many ways, Kathleen Goddard Jones. Uh, Kathleen Cairns is the one who authored the two pages within this um, self-guided walking tour, uh, emphasizing <coughs> Maria Josefa and her story, which I think is a really compelling one. So uh, we're going to have her as our Carnegie lecturer in June in, uh, at the Dalla de Adobe. Uh, we're going to talk about um, one of the daughters of Pierre Dalla de and his wife, uh, uh, Antonio Salazar, Thomas, is that the name of the... Ascension Concepcion, and her daughter, also Ascension, Sen, Maria, Maria Ascension, uh, also known as Sen, was an artist. And uh, so her story is one that, again, Kathy is going to help us to tell in uh, six months. So um, preview. Any of you who would like to join our History Center, uh, get active with us, involved uh, with the Carnegie Lecture as well with our exhibits, I invite you all who are here to stay. I invite those of you on Zoom to come in. If you haven't lately, we have a fairly new exhibit on the Jewish community in the Central Coast. We'll have new exhibits coming in uh, a couple of times in 2022 as well. And uh, look forward to seeing everybody uh, come here, come to the Dalla Day events, help support this organization, help to support the Dana Adobe Group too, and um, help support historic preservation in Cambria or wherever you are. So. Thank you all. Great job. Thank you again. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks to everybody. Appreciate you all. Should I go ahead and end now? I think so.